caucus on both sides of the hill uh, for working with us on this event today. Uh, my mission here is to move the conversation along and get you engaged in it because we really do want to have uh, an interactive discussion both up here and then uh, questions from the crowd. So what I'm going to do is introduce quickly the four speakers you are going to hear from. We'll have kind of modules of discussion and then move to a more open discussion with the rest of you. Uh, proceeding on my left and your right, we'll hear first from Ryan Lorraine, who is the leader of the Kaspersky Lab Global Research and Analysis Team, the U.S. Uh, team of researchers. He has extensive experience in computer user education and uh, early in his career uh, monitored security and hacker attack trends for over 10 years as a journalist. And so he brings a combination of both communication and great uh, knowledge of the, the technology involved here. The U.S. Uh, Center of, of Kaspersky Lab uh, employment here is in Woburn, Massachusetts. So he comes to us from there. Also comes <coughs> to us from the Boston area, and here is our second speaker, Daniel Shear, General Counsel for Carbonite. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Carbonite, a publicly traded uh, storage, secure uh, storage and backup company. Uh, Danielle is a founding member of Carbonite's legal team. She oversees their global legal affairs, including compliance and guiding their international expansion efforts. Prior to Carbonite, she worked for corporate uh, and security law firm Wilkie Farr and Gallagher, where she specialized in technology-related corporate matters. Interestingly, I, I thought of note too, uh, Danielle made it to the Boston Business Journal's 40 Under 40 list of emerging business leaders in Boston. Congratulations on that. Next, we'll hear from the U.S. government. Uh, Richard Downing, about one year ago, was selected to serve as the acting deputy assistant attorney general for the criminal division at the Department of Justice. Uh, earlier, he had served as principal deputy chief of the computer crime and intellectual property section, uh, supervising prosecution on such matters as hacking, identity theft, intellectual property crimes, and others. He joined the department in 1999, so he's been at the department for a good while now and earlier served as assistant dis a district attorney in Philadelphia. Last and certainly not least, we go to Dante Desparte. Dante is the founder and CEO of the Risk Cooperative, a strategy, risk, and capital management firm. So he's making his living and indeed writing books about how to manage risk in the digital age with fast changes. Prior to forming Risk Cooperative, he served as the managing director of Clements Worldwide, a leading insurance broker that operates in more than 170 uh, countries. So that will be our lineup, and to get us thinking about this, I wanted to come up with a little bit of a scenario around ransomware that maybe most of our Hill audience could relate to. We're on the other side of an election, but let's imagine it's one week out from your boss's election. Last night, your boss and the other party's candidate had a debate and I got a lot of press coverage and your phones and email both off the hook. <coughs> to make matters worse, there's a major donor event tonight for your boss, and so you're getting lots of calls, questions, and attention, press attention around that. And now the presidential party nominee for your party is going to be at that event. And so now you have to merge donor files from the state party and the national party in your district uh, campaign effort. You need that by the end of the day. Your boss is calling because he's got to do interviews about the protesters outside the campaign office, and as you have remarks to be written for tonight, uh, press is calling because of the protesters. Your boss has accepted a TV interview and he's talking points for that. Uh, and to make matters worse, the opposition has just launched a social media uh, kind of attack on your campaign, and so social media also is going off the hook. And in that setting, with phones ringing, email blaring, social media attack underway, your screen goes blank and says, uh, for $500 in Bitcoin, you can get your system back. And by the way, the phones are down too because you tied your IT phones into your computer system. So by a show of hands, how many of you pay to go get Bitcoin, $500 worth of Bitcoin and pay? How many pay? Wow, tough crowd. Liars. <laughs> so you are going to tell the boss that, sorry, the talking points have to wait. We're not going to respond to the social media. 
I mean, I could have a speech for tonight with presidential nominees. It's starting to look like a tough environment for your continued employment. <laughs> but that is the kind of uh, tough choice that people are facing much more, perhaps, than people on Capitol Hill realize. And that's what we're going to get to today. And then the question, do you pay or do you not pay living in this age of ransomware? So first, Ryan, tell us some of the latest numbers. I know you have some new data. How widespread is ransomware? Uh, thank you, Sam, and thank you for this. Thank you, Phil, and thank you for the committee for, put, for putting this together. Um, ransomware is easily, easily the number one issue we face today uh, in terms of complaints and, and requests for assistance from our customers and prospects of ours. Uh, the scenario that Phil painted may not be as, as, as dire for a lot of small businesses, but it's very much the same thing. There's a sense of desperation that is forcing uh, small businesses to pay ransoms. It's the only way they can recover. Uh, we are seeing uh, exponential increase in ransomware, fa uh, ransomware attacks and ransomware families as well. So uh, one ransomware uh, malware sample, uh, we are starting to see a dramatic increase in variants of that sample, which means it's, it's publicly available uh, the cyber criminals are picking it up and launching attacks with those. For 2016, we saw uh, 55 new ransomware families, which means uh, 55 new variants, uh, and on top of those, we've seen an increase in, in, in variants and other families that, uh, launching these attacks. Uh, this has been a 10 to 15 percent increase in these types of modifications. Uh, at the beginning of 2016, our software was registering uh, a ransomware attack every 20 every 20 seconds. At the end of 2016, it was a ransomware attack every 10 seconds in terms of ones that we detected. And we are the number four. We're the number four uh, uh, anti-malware provider in the world, which means we're seeing just a small. Uh, sample of what the bigger guys are also seeing. So we can, we can extrapolate those numbers and get a sense of uh, what it is. We just partnered with uh, Europol and uh, law enforcement agencies throughout Europe on a no ransom project that allows us to get access to servers and command and controls owned by cyber criminals so we can extract recovery keys for people to recover their files. And uh, data coming out of that partnership uh, shows that one in five businesses hit by ransomware is paying the ransom, and uh, just about two in five are actually reporting it to law enforcement or are actually going public with the data. So uh, all the numbers we're giving you here, I think it's a safe bet to assume it's on the low end. Uh, people are not very willing to come forward and say they've been hit. And on top of that, the, the companies that are less likely to come forward are the companies that are most likely to be hit because they don't have resources for uh, uh, security teams, uh, IT professionals, they don't have uh, dedicated IT staff to keep systems patched and keep it protected. So it's just this vicious cycle of, um, uh, of, of the data not, the data being on the low end. And I just want to finish quickly with a, a quick anecdote. I travel around the country and around the world helping with user education around ransomware, helping businesses to be prepared, helping them to you know, put together a recovery strategy and a risk management approach to dealing with this ransomware epidemic. And part of my spiel is never pay. People should never pay because it just emboldens cyber criminals. Uh, uh, you have no uh, guarantee of getting your data back. Uh, and it's kind of our official company policy. During the coffee breaks, people actually pull me aside and says, you live up, you know, you live in your cloud telling people not to pay. The reality is we are so desperate, our entire business is down. We are out of business completely and paying $500, like, like, like Phil suggested, is our only option. So, I mean, I hope we could trigger a discussion here about, you know, the reality and the grounds for people facing these, uh, this, this, these attacks versus, uh, you know, what policy should be. A couple of follow-ups. And, and I know other panelists may have some too. When you describe the kind of mutations, the families, 
then each mutation makes that newest version possible to decrypt. Or, or you have to write a new decryption piece of software. Correct. So we've done, what, what we've done, we've put together a, a automated way, ways to handle the discovery of these new variants. And we've also built specialized tools to what we call smart signatures, where you'll, you'll write a signature for one uh, family, and depending on characteristics of the others, you'll be able to detect the others. So it's, become, it's becoming easier. It's not foolproof. I mean, it's, we're, we're still chasing, uh, we're still chasing our tails, so to speak. Um, that's on technology side. I think it's a it's a scramble to solve it, but the technology alone uh, is not going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, we need user education. We need people to stop clicking on stupid links on Facebook. <laughs> and, you know, but on all these things we've been saying for ten years and it hasn't worked. Uh, user education hasn't worked. So uh, we have we need to uh, have uh, the technology component partnership between law enforcement and private sector. Uh, government policy, <coughs> and I'm not a policy guy, I'm not a politician at all, I'm just a researcher. <laughs> These guys have the, the harder task of, of figuring out how do we get a grip of this. And what does ransomware look like five years from now, 10 years from now? I mean, it, 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 we saw this coming 10 years ago. This ransomware issue is not new. It's been around for a long time. It's now kind of bubbling up into an epidemic. So where does it go five, 10 years from now? It's something we really need to start thinking about. I have some ideas, but I just one, one other, uh, or one follow up for you and one for the crowd. Um, do you have any numbers, Ryan, on what percentage of folks who pay then do not unlock? So the criminal does not honor their deal. We have, uh, we don't have the raw data because, again, the uh, actual numbers on people reporting it is, is hard to, to get. What we do, what we do find is, uh, and this is something that's really even more worrying, is uh, a ransomware sample might get uh, posted to the internet, or or a toolkit that creates it gets put uh, on dark websites, open source, so to speak, and then that makes it easy for anyone to become a ransomware guy, and you know, kids and script kiddies everywhere are picking up these files, creating ransomware. Uh, Creating ransomware variants and launching attacks, and they're not—they're uh, not Im implementing the encryption routines and the keys properly. So even if you pay, they have no way of even getting the keys back to you because it's not properly kept. So then your files are gone forever. The other thing to keep in mind: how many people here are familiar with wipers, like pieces of malware that are capable of wiping out your entire? On a technical level, there's no difference between ransomware and a wiper. The ransomware basically just encrypts the files and, and demands payment for uh, a recovery key. It's the same, te technically, they have the capability of wiping everything from those machines, and wiping your company out of business. Uh, and Daniel can go talk about the importance of, of backing up and making sure that's part of your recovery process. But imagine, again, on a technical level, imagine down the road some very sophisticated attackers look into do wiper style attacks. Backup will be your only recovery option. So, you know, there's a lot of moving parts in this in this discussion that I think it's very important for people to wrap their heads around how severe the issue is today, uh, the possibility of how much more dangerous it can be, and five, ten years from now with emergence of IoT and everything being connected. Where does ransomware go next? Is it just gonna be limited to PCs? Are we gonna start seeing ransomware taking Taking uh, connecting alarm systems in people's homes. I mean, these are all technical possibilities. And wherever there's money and wherever there's a profit motive, the cyber criminals will go there. We've seen this over the course of the last 10 to 50 years. So it's only logical that we'll see it moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, before we transition to Danielle, show of hands, has any of the staff heard from people in the district about ransomware? Or has it been crickets? So we have one. Anybody else? That's kind of what I suspected, but you're not going to hear like you do on so many other issues back home. You know, when they say you got to fix this, this is one people are probably not going to call their congressman about because they have to admit that they were breached and information uh, held ransom and so forth. So not surprising, but I just want to check. Then, you know, um, talk to us about this both from a legal perspective as well as the backup perspective. 
So um, that was a really good question that you just asked. Um, that's going to change. Um, in the next 10 years, probably less, in the next five, every single one of you will become a victim of ransomware. I'm positive of it. Um, put money on it. You guys can all take my email address, which will probably change as you know, we're like <laughs> moving. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of like when we all started out with email and everybody had an AOL email account. Like, there should be probably nobody in this room who still has an AOL email account. But, but it's going to happen, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think one of the, the most important things that we can do today is ask for your help. Um, and each of us have a different bent on this, but we don't actually have the answer. And I think the answer is going to have to come from the people in this room and, and a lot of your colleagues. Um, so let me back up. Uh, I just wanted you to see where I'm going with these comments. Um, there's a three-prong approach today to dealing with ransomware. Um, one is fortifying your boundaries, right? Um, but a lot of people in this room um, and everybody on this panel could tell you they're already in, right? So you have to do that, but they're already in. Uh, actually, everybody in this room should know that because probably most of your data has been stolen um, as a result of the last government hack that happened yeah. about a year ago. Um, two, um, use Kaspersky solutions or something else like that to alert you when somebody gets in so that you can try to minimize the damage. And three, have a copy of your data so that nobody can hold you ransom to get it back. That's the best that we have come up with so far, but there has got to be a better answer. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, well, and also, uh, make sure you have some kind of insurance because you are going to get sued. Because um, not only is your data bricked, not only are you not able to get your boss what he needs, um, or she needs, Phil's example, but um, now somebody has access to the data that was on those servers and, and the, those computers. So in Phil's example, that donor list, um, some of which is probably extremely confidential, um, imagine how much that's going to go for now, um, uh, the donors in the district and how much they're getting. And who is going to sue you as a result of that becoming public information? Um, I think that where we need your help is not on the technical side to prevent ransomware or to beat cyber criminals, because there are really smart people who are trying to figure that out, and we should let them do that work. But um, you're a victim twice. Once, because your data has gotten bricked, um, and you're paying some kind of money. Um, twice, because the lawyers are going to descend upon you. Um, you're going to get sued because personal data has been breached, because it's going to be used in some way. You don't might, you might not even know what the damages are. And if a if a hungry plaintiff's attorney doesn't come after you, the DOJ is going to come after you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but so we have to fix this problem somehow. You can't be a victim twice. Um, I think everybody is starting to realize now in the aftermath of the TJ Maxx and Home Depot and, uh, uh, or TJ Maxx and uh, Target. And uh, it actually recently happened with Seagate. Um, all of their employee data um, was hacked. Um, that these companies are actually victims, right? We should not also be going after them. And um, Carbonite, you know, we come in because we provide the backed up copy for a really low amount of money. We can back up all of your data to the Carbonite Cloud, and in the event that you become the victim of ransomware, you can get it all back. Um, and that's important, but um, it doesn't solve the problem of somebody having your data, access to your data in the first place. And what are you gonna do about that? I don't have the answer, um, but, uh, but you guys are gonna need to think through this because it is going to become a reality of all of the small businesses in each of your districts, and it's gonna become a reality probably for you personally if you have your, uh, uh, if you have a budget on your PC at home along with all of your family pictures, if you somewhere keep a list of all of your passwords to get into your banks and your 401k, I mean, can you imagine what would happen if somebody got a hold of this, and it is so easy to do it. It's not just the stupid memes on Facebook with a link. Um, really sophisticated ransom or cyber criminals actually mimic the email addresses of some of your closest friends by studying your behavior. Um, so, there you go. And uh, I know, Daniel, you had a couple of thoughts, too, on <coughs> kind of uh, proceed with caution on the part.
policy front because we could wave a magic wand and say never pay ransom. U.S. businesses are not allowed to pay ransom, which would put a lot of U.S. businesses at disadvantage in a global right. environment. Yeah. Right. So, so proceed cautiously because of the internet. Everything is a global policy issue now in this space. I think that. Yes. Um, so that's a really good thought to make sure that we leave you with, which is. Um, and I guess you guys know better than anybody that when you legislate, it almost always has unintended consequences and almost always not, you know, with the best of intentions, right? Um, and in this area, as, as because technology adapts faster than law and legislation and politics, we have to be really, really careful. Um, a policy like don't pay um, cyber criminals um, is just asking for people to be in violation of the law. Um, and then there's going to be a whole bunch of litigation for people being in violation of the law. Um, because that's just not a reality for, for some businesses. Um, so I have some more thoughts, but I will, uh, I'll, I'll seed and we'll see where it goes. <laughs> well, that, that makes a great transition because uh, the Department of Justice, you guys are living with the law and uh, enforcing the law and also dealing with everything on this digital frontier as it, as it comes through too. So uh, over to you. Uh, so uh, if you haven't heard enough scary stories, I have a couple more quick ones for you. Um, of course, average American losing $500 in Bitcoin in order to get their photos back is a bad thing. Um, but it also comes up in various different ways. Uh, we've had, for example, a police department in Massachusetts that had its entire computers and mugshot database and working and whatnot uh, end up uh, getting uh, encrypted and unable to be used. And you may have seen in the news uh, earlier this year several hospitals uh, that ended up getting, uh, having their computers uh, be uh, affected. I ended up actually just as a, on a, a personal relationship with one of the people who was a nurse at one of these hospitals. I said, well, what do you guys do? working. And she said, well, we have paper records, um, so we tried and we did our best. We didn't, you know, nobody was going to die because of this because we could back, go, go back to paper records. She said, but the treatment decisions may not have been exactly the same because we were missing important data. And so we took the most conservative approach to make sure nobody got hurt. I said, well, that doesn't sound like a very good plan to me. And you never know when some mistake might happen and somebody could get um, very seriously one more small one, um, the CryptoLocker uh, malware was used in 2013-2014. Um, estimated $27 million was gained by uh, the people who put this out uh, in about two months. And this is uh, directly money being funneled into Eastern European organized crime. So that's a scary thing as well. So um, why am I on the panel? What's the government's role? That's the really question I want to uh, see if I can put out there. Certainly, uh, the government has a role in helping uh, companies and technology firms to get the kind of technological solutions out there that make sense, and in doing things like uh, promoting information sharing. So, of course, earlier this year, the uh, Cyber Information uh, Sharing Act, CISA, was passed by Congress. That's the kind of thing that can promote an environment where people are willing to share signatures and different kinds of uh, pieces of security information that actually help the community, help the government protect itself and help others in the community. These types of malware are often distributed through botnets and through malicious software, and so having the ability to, to share that information can be very effective in trying to prevent the initial infections from happening, which would then result in having the uh, encryption engaged and the ransom be demanded. Uh, the Department of Justice also has a cybersecurity unit, um, and one of the goals of that is, again, to share best practices and to help uh, individuals and businesses think through the needs of trying to secure their own networks from the perspective. Uh, we have, uh, Jane, as a result of our many uh, prosecutions of the offenders over the years, and so I would encourage you to take a look at our website for that. But I think importantly, and this is where I want to spend a little bit of time, is that part of the solution, uh, in addition to the steps that have been mentioned already about securing your systems and building technologies to protect us, is that sooner or later, as uh, uh, the 
and Mel mentioned uh, <coughs> they're going to get in, what are we going to do then? And so part of the solution, in my view, is to have an aggressive posture of investigating and prosecuting these individuals for the criminals that they are. And therefore, figuring that out and doing our best to address that as a problem can create deterrence in the same way that we deter other sorts of crimes, and we want to make sure that, that there are no easy and safe and quick and lucrative ways to make this a very profitable business if we can. And so, for example, in 2014, the Department of Justice uh, brought indictments and uh, did a technical takedown of the crypto locker malware in conjunction with the botnet called Game Over Juice. Uh, we were actually able to uh, deploy uh, search warrants and court orders to shut down the activity um, and to stop completely as a result of that activity. The individuals, however, were not yet. And so, although they are under indictment, they have not yet brought them to trial in the United States. However, we have had success against other types of, especially Eastern European criminals, who are purveyors of the botnets and links of code. And indeed, in April this year, we uh, court sentenced two guys, Alexander Panin, who was a Russian, and Hamza Benalaj, who was an Algerian, both extradited or brought to the United States, and they received the long prison sentences. And this is the kind of thing that we want to do more of, is to create that deterrence that there is no person beyond the reach of the law, and that we can create that kind of current message, and then the FBI has dozens of investigations open at the moment. <clears throat> However, it is not an easy kind of investigation to do, and so let me just mention a couple of the hurdles. Uh, very often, the criminals use the Tor network to anonymize themselves and make it harder for us to identify them. Uh, they use Bitcoin, as was mentioned, and Bitcoin is uh, very um, attractive to criminals because it creates irreversible transactions, unlike, say, PayPal, where you can call up your PayPal and say that I need a return on my credit uh, card because I was ripped off. That can be done, but it's Bitcoin is irreversible and it creates an anonymity that, that, that criminals uh, like to exploit as well. <laughs> Second one is the trans border problem. Uh, very often, these attacks are coming from outside of the United States and it makes it much harder for us to gather evidence when that evidence is located in another country or the individuals themselves are located. And so we've done a number of things as a department to try to keep this problem by building up good working relationships with the governments of the other countries, law enforcement agencies, so that we can count on their assistance and we can work together to try to bring, uh, to, to gather evidence and to make arrests. And so that's one of our uh, emphasis as well. Uh, we also need to build our own technological sophistication as, uh, as a department, as law enforcement agents. Um, and this is uh, obviously necessary if we're going to be able to do these investigations. We need to understand what's going on and understand the technology. And uh, we have very much looked to the relationships with the project sector, with research companies, with antivirus companies uh, that are, uh, enable us to work together, understand the problems, and try to solve them. In order for us to be effective, though, we also need to get those reports of victims and victim um, information. Um, so I would strongly encourage you, if you were in the situation, and to anyone who asked, part of being effective at uh, responding in an investigative way is to have that initial report. Um, that there are ways for the average citizen to do it through the Internet Crime Complaint Center. It's an online form. It's very easy and uh, to do, so that, that reduces the barriers there. But certainly if it's a significant case like a hospital has been affected, having a direct report to the FBI or the Secret Service uh, would be strongly encouraged. Um, uh, let me uh, beg to differ about whether DOJ will come after you. Uh, nope, that's not what we do. We treat victims as victims, and we want to work with victims to make sure that they are uh, we're doing what we can to help protect them, and of course so that we can use that information to go forward with investigations or perhaps put it with other information. Um, very often the question is raised, well, is it permissible or lawful to pay a ransom or not? Uh, it is not illegal to pay ransom to criminals. Let me just set that out there. You are not admitting to a crime if you come to us and tell us that you've been victimized and that you decided to pay. We still want to hear um, what's going on there. However, for the reasons that um, the uh, earlier comments uh, made clear, maybe not the greatest idea to pay a ransom to you. Uh, may not get your database back and it'll be all for nothing. Uh, it may in fact signal to the hackers uh, that um, you're willing to pay and they might continue to uh, up their demands. Um, 
and as I mentioned too, it does have the effect of supporting organized crime, and which is not a good thing as well. And so, in general matter, the U.S. government doesn't encourage the paying of ransoms. Um, however, <coughs> given that, we also understand that it's a serious decision, especially for businesses that need to protect their customers and their employees and their shareholders. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not here to pass judgment, if you like, <laughs> on whether that is a decision that, that you have to make. Um, however, what I would emphasize is that that, that decision is not mutually exclusive with reporting to law enforcement. <coughs> One last uh, hurdle that we face is uh, actually one particular for everyone in this room, which is legislation. Um, one of the important things that we need to be able to do in order to address the ransomware problem is to look at the way that it's distributed through malware and through botnets. And so, uh, on the one hand, there is actually a, a rule change uh, uh, as part of the federal rules of criminal procedure um, that will enhance our ability to address the botnet problem. Um, and this is a, is a change um, that we uh, strongly support, that uh, has been through two years of work in the judicial system through the committees on the rules and was approved by the Supreme Court in April <coughs> this year and is now uh, imminently going to go into effect if Congress uh, chooses to let that go through. Um, the basic idea, though, just so that you understand, is Back in 1917, when they created these rules, they said if you want to get a warrant, you have to go to the district where the property is located that you're going to search. Um, but it doesn't make a lot of sense, especially in this context where a botnet or the victims of this are everywhere across the country. And so in order to get a search warrant, we'd have to go to 94 district courts around the country, which is, makes no sense at all. And so this is a venue decision, and the, uh, the rule change that would permit a single judge to accept a warrant and evaluate it and decide whether it's uh, proper. There's also a provision uh, that uses uh, civil injunctive authority, which the administration has put forward, for example, <coughs> to make clear that that is also a tool that can be used in shutting down bombs and working on uh, some of these broad malware problems. So I'm sorry that was a pretty high level blazing fast uh, view on the legislative stuff. I'm more than happy to go into more detail, though, if that's something that well, when Phil, a when Phil asked about legislation, I was going to talk about the Stop Mass Hacking Act, but I wasn't sure we'd get there. Um, so the Stop Mass Hacking Act is an antithesis to the Rule 41 changes, um, and I don't know what the right answer is. I totally understand that law enforcement needs greater tools in order to ferret out who these cyber criminals are. True. Totally true. Um, but I'll give you the company's perspective of why the Rule 41 changes, if they're allowed to go forward by Congress, um, who I don't think knows very much about this, there's this, there's this act called Stop Mass Hacking Act that um, if you guys support it, it, the Rule 41 changes would not go into effect. Um, here's the problem from a company's perspective. Uh, number one, uh, you know, Carbonite provides backup to customers, anywhere from $59 a year to you know, $1,000 a year, we get a copy of your data and we store it in the cloud and then if a, for a variety of reasons, if your computer breaks, if it gets lost, if whatever, a cyber criminal breaks it. Um, I spend a good portion of my day responding to subpoenas and warrants from a variety of government agencies uh, for which Carbonite doesn't get paid. Um, and those subpoenas and warrants are looking for Carbonite to decrypt user data in connection with ongoing investigations important investigations, terrorism, child pornography, other kinds of really bad people. Nevertheless, um, that's a lot of work. And it's not entirely clear who is checking um, to make sure that the standards are being met and subpoenas and warrants are being issued. And the Rule 41 changes would allow judges, no matter of location, to um, to request this information. So instead of you being in a jurisdiction, um, like if there's a criminal in Florida, um, uh, a judge in Massachusetts can force, uh, or a judge in Florida can force a Massachusetts company to respond to their subpoena, um, which has not been the case until late. That's actually, it's sort of like a, a legal headache and lots of legal academics can disagree there. That's actually not what I'm most worried about. 
Um, and I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on this because I haven't had the chance to talk to anybody about uh, the government's response. Uh, I think the problem with the Rule 41 changes is that, from my understanding, if, um, if, you, if, if you become the victim of a uh, cyber attack, ransomware attack, if your computer is infected, that allows the government to get into your systems. So you guys are pretty much all familiar with the argument that there's a, uh, we're all worried that the government will create a back door into companies. Remember what the San Bernardino and getting people to crack open that, getting Apple to crack open that iPhone and they work so hard not to do it. Um, this feels like to a lot of tech companies, another way to get a back door into companies and customers. Um, so it's important. And so I don't know the right answer, and I'm certainly not advocating um, one way or the other because I'm just not informed enough. This all seemed to happen very quickly. Um, but to Phil's point that legislation is important and being informed about the issues that you're legislating and understanding it from a 360 degree perspective, it's critical. Because if the Rule 41 changes will be used by our government to get access to companies' systems and, and, and thereby customer information, I do not think that that was what was ultimately intended by the Rule 41 changes. Um, so, uh, I'm happy to provide a perspective here. Um, I'm glad that uh, you uh, say that you have an open mind and feel like you haven't gotten enough information so maybe I can supply some information. Um, First of all, uh, let me walk through what you said. Uh, Carbon is responding to a lot of subpoenas and warrants, and you're not getting paid. Okay, well, that does entitle you to get paid, so if you wanted to ask for payment, you can. We do, we do, but you know what I mean. It's a lot of work. Fair enough. Number two, the kind of warrants that would be used in that situation uh, are under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. They already have national scope and have this kind of effect. Um, they can be issued anywhere in the country and served on carbon uh, where they're located. Rule 41 actually doesn't have anything to do with that. Rule 41 is a situation where uh, the law enforcement officers would execute the warrant themselves, not that they're asking a provider to assist. So it's actually eating apples and oranges. That's a different uh, authority. Um, on the point about who's checking and making sure the standards are being followed, um, we're pretty comfortable that um, those standards are going to be met regardless of whether there's a change in Rule 41 because all of the same rules apply before and after the rule change happens. You still have to go to a federal judge. You still have to follow the Constitution. You still have to follow all the rules. In fact, the Rule 41 change doesn't change any of those standards or any of those reviews that would happen. And indeed, all it does is tell the agent which judge to go to, or in the case of Bob Nick, that you can go to a single judge rather than the really foolish uh, necessity of going to 94 of them uh, and you ask for the same warrant over and over again. Um, this is not about back doors. Uh, this is about authority to uh, go in as a result of getting a warrant and using a, a, a capability to do that. It's not going to create the ability to set up vulnerability in computer machines of anything of that sort. And lastly, it didn't happen quickly. <laughs> it's been going on for the last three years. There have been public hearings. There have been various layers, like five layers. It's, from my perspective, provincially slow at the process mm -hmm. that we've been working here. And indeed, at every step of the way, judges and defense attorneys and academics have looked at this and gone, yeah, that makes sense. We should have this kind of authority. The Supreme Court unanimously said, yep, and moved it forward. So I, I really uh, don't think it's fair to say that this is a sort of, as some people in the press have said, a secret process that's like this all by. No, no, this is the process by which rules are amended <coughs> under the law that uh, the Rules Enabling Act that Congress passed, and this is the orderly way in which these things are done. And a lot of smart people have looked at this and said, this makes sense. So um, my purity of defense of this is this. Uh, this is really important for law enforcement. Um, I'm going to just add that as a footnote. Um, not only does it have this effect in the botnet context, but it's useful in going after really horrendous activities that are happening and using the anonymity provided by things like the Tor network, where we had an operation which saved um, 48 children from ongoing sexual abuse. This is only going to be possible if we have the ability to get a warrant to do that. And if the rule 
actually does a domino effect that well, causes that all to be eked out. So um, that's a question I would ask if someone says to you, should we oppose this or not? Ask them, what's going to be the impact on ongoing investigations involving very serious crimes where they use the anonymity of the internet to be able to hide their uh, their surveillance activity from law enforcement? Great, thank you. I'm glad we got there because it is a perfect internet caucus style issue. The internet, no boundaries, impacts public policy built on boundaries. And I'm glad we touched this issue because there is controversy between privacy and law enforcement on this. Uh, great, great needs and great advocates on both sides of that. I'm sure you'll be hearing more maybe a future Internet Caucus time. It's also appropriate that we do it here in the Judiciary Committee hearing room because this is where um, this committee, among others, that, that has to wrestle with that. So Rule 41, one other aspect of, of this whole consideration as we look at the repercussions from bad people getting at your information and, and then law enforcement trying to deal with that. Um, Dante, bring us back here to the big picture. What we just described, whether it is malware, ransomware, <coughs> or, or whatever, is a fast-changing risk scenario for the companies that comprise our economy to operate in. In fact, in many ways, Rule 41 in law enforcement is just another risk factor because you've got to think through what the risks to, to information are. Bring us back to kind of the big picture here. How do companies deal with this today? How do they wrestle with their down and ensure themselves so they can move forward? Um, thanks, Bill, and thanks to my uh, fellow pal panelists. A uh, very interesting conversation so far. So um, I'm in the business of ultimately financing these unfortunate events when they occur. And I guess at a, at a national level, I would take us all back to the moments before internet commerce really took off. That the big scare back then was ID theft and phishing scams, and people were afraid of using their credit and debit cards online. And in the middle of this multi-trillion dollar global e-commerce market stood risk. Risk was literally the thing that stood in the way. And so, one of the attributes of defanging this risk was the concept of a zero liability proposition. And now I'm speaking really on a retail level, and I'll get to ransomware in a moment. But for the retail consumer, it wasn't, we didn't really unlock all of this value until retail consumers were told, whether it was by their banks and others, that you have a zero liability proposition when you buy online. And so unlocking this thing created an enormous amount of market value worldwide. And so I think if you, if you fast forward to today, and there's no doubt that 2016 is the year of cyber risk, right? But it just, I think this is very much the opening salvo. Um, and I would, I would completely agree with the, the testament that 10 years from today, everyone in this room would have gone through the very experiences we're outlining. But if you fast forward to today, and you think about which businesses will suffer the most from ransomware and cyber risk, it's the middle market. And it's the lower end of the, of the economic food chain, the companies that create the jobs, the companies that employ the vast majority of our people are, are not able to withstand these types of shock events. And so when you think about my function in cyber risk, it's really business continuity. That when a ransom attack occurs, they're so successful at crippling the way companies create value, is that imagine a persistent ransom attack. Imagine that it's not weeks, but it's months and it starts to erode into the very fiber of an organization, you can't pay bills and you're facing a prospect where you have to lay off your staff and all of the rest, the insurance industry really slots in there because there's not a company today that has a war room dedicated to resolving these issues or a balance sheet sufficiently large to address these issues. And that's really the, the gap that the insurance industry is there to fill. Um, but I think one of the ways we'll start to really bring much more public disclosure and really start to defang cyber risk, but particularly ransomware, is by really going after the zero liability proposition. To, you know, the double whammy that, um, that was just described, that uh, Danielle described, you could defang one aspect of it, partly through legislation, but partly through the same way we address, you know, uh, phishing scams and, and the things that stood in the way of online uh, purchases is that you have to have a zero liability proposition, particularly for small to mid-sized enterprises. 
These are the companies that are um, most vulnerable, they're least prepared, they don't have the type of cyber budget um, to outspend you know, the way the, the largest companies in our economy can. And so those firms are the most vulnerable and they're at the same time the least prepared. But how to respond to a ransom, a ransom attack? So kidnap and ransom insurance is a good place to start to look at what were the economic motivators and, and the other motives of a, of a general kidnapping. And the property of a ransom, whether it's a cyber ransom attack or a physical one, are exactly the same. It's not a ransom unless someone's triggering you to do something, change a course of action, pay a fee. The economic kidnappings can all be resolved. It's the political ones that scare the heck out of us, right? So, you know, and, and we saw this taking place in the insurance market years ago when express kidnappings and kidnappings in Mexico and different parts of Latin America an entire cottage industry blossomed around resolving this, and most people got out safely um, when, there was a, when there was an economic motive at play. Companies, and really the Sony Entertainment hack would be the very first, most prominent example. It was an attack on Sony that had no economic motive whatsoever. It was purely political, it was driven by a nation state actor, um, and the motive really, and they successfully proved that they could cripple a firm of that size. This is a massive global enterprise, and every facet of its value chain was brought to a halt. So, you know, on pay, not pay, I, I say wherever there is an economic motive, the payment is only uh, driven, and it's only really a point of deep pressure for companies that don't have a plan, right? So if you're put in a corner and you know you don't get to call on Lloyd's, or you don't get to call on companies like ours to help you out, then you have no choice but to pay us, right? And so I'm glad you made it clear that paying doesn't produce necessarily a legal consequence, although it certainly brings with it a reputational consequence. Um, so, you know, I think on the issue, you have to pay these claims, and, and those firms that have insurance programs behind them, insurance, depending on how you structure it, will typically respond to uh, one of these types of economic ransom demands um, with a cyber attack. But um, the real issue, I think, is a broader one of how to defang these types of risks to the middle market. Those are the companies that are most vulnerable. They're the ones that have, uh, I think, the most to lose, and they're the least prepared. And, and information sharing, I've already mentioned, could be a huge part of that. Yeah. If we can get small and medium-sized businesses into information sharing bodies and, and really doing that, again, resources are a challenge. It's not like they have an IT department um, resource. Well, let's open it up to, to some questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll acknowledge you. Tell us who you are and belt out your question loud enough for everybody to hear. Uh, a real opportunity to, to address some experts here. While I'm waiting on that first brave questioner to stand up, I'm going to ask Ryan to comment. Uh, Mr. Downing mentioned deterrence as one of the, the real goals here. And I think you had a if not data, at least years of observation that deterrence seems to really work. The criminals go where the, lead, the lowest barrier is. It does. Uh, the issue we find is that as we deal with, with ransomware, and, and we have this, this no ransom uh, partnership with law enforcement agencies, mostly in Europe, we're in discussions to have some uh, US law enforcement partners join, is uh, like Mr. Downey explained, cyber criminal, most of the cyber criminals in, in the ransomware sphere is, are, are in Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria. Uh, the, the best we can do is get access to their command and control services, store the recovery key, keys. I try not to say decryption keys because this gets lost in the, in the Apple versus the government discussion, so I try to say recovery keys uh, are stored on these command and control servers, and the only way we can get access to it, it's illegal for us to go get it without uh, the, assistance of law, the assistance of law enforcement. And our priority as a computer security company is just helping uh, end users get recovery keys, free recovery keys that they can uh, retrieve their data without having to pay the ransom. We get uh, biggest hiccup for us is this cross-border uh, non-existence of cooperation where we try to get uh, to a server in the Ukraine and without the help 
with those personal uh, personal relationships and some arm wringing and you know getting someone to make a call. There's no there's no straightforward ways to uh, no straightforward clearinghouse to come and say okay here's the IP address of a command and control server we know has 10 million recovery keys that we can create a decryption key and get it out there to save five million uh, small businesses from going out of business. We could, I can give, we can, cre we can create a recovery, a decryption tool, a recovery utility with access to these keys. But again, it's the, the cyber criminals are somewhere in the world. We are, we are relying entirely on law enforcement agencies to help with our cooperation. To be completely honest with you, many law enforcement agencies are like dark holes. You just, you go in there and it just, you never hear from them again. And this is some of the, you know, real frustrations we deal with as a computer security company trying to, you know, one of our big tasks in this project is to uh, create free recovery tools. Uh, to get that, we need law enforcement to help us get access to servers. We can go in and get access to these servers. It's incredibly legal to hack into these servers and get it. You know, technically, it's, it's possible, but it's like you get to that point and you throw it to law enforcement and you sit back and wait and uh, when you finally hear from them, there are 10 more servers in the line. And this is the... You mean uh, foreign law enforcement or U.S. law enforcement? I mean foreign law enforcement. Okay, I, I want to hear about it, but you're getting a blank wall from uh, the, the people that I work with because they... Uh, I know the FBI Crime Complaint law. Center and, and uh, local law enforcement agencies here in the U.S. have been incredibly responsive. The problem is that they... These, these servers are not located here. It's very rare that you'll find a server located here. The servers we are going up, it's in, it's in Ukraine. When you go to the Ukrainian police, they have bigger issues than worrying about a, a, a ransomware server. They have, they have bombs falling on their heads. You know what I mean? So it's... How about some questions from our audience? Somebody, hey, yes, right there, and that's over here. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please, and identify yourself and then allow them uh, hi, I'm Danielle from Copper Talking Union. Um, so one of the questions that we have is, you said a lot of the numbers are murky on uh, who is actually getting attacked, like how many people have been affected by ransomware, but could you give me any of those numbers? From our side, it's impossible. Okay. I mean, I think the, the, the most uh, legitimate numbers I've seen have come from the FBI, the Cyber Crime Complaint Center, mm -hmm. and even there, I'm sure they'll admit it's on the very, very low level. It's, people are just not reporting it. Uh, from businesses to consumers, large businesses, small businesses. For every hospital you hear in the news paid $17,000, there's three or four on the low end that get uh, healthcare agencies have never reported it. Or may have reported it to law enforcement, but it never makes it to either the media or makes it to the security companies. The other issue is they might report it to law enforcement and, and it might make it to the news, but they'll work with a very small private security company to help them with their recovery. And that information doesn't get shared with the rest of the security companies to have uh, uh, protection tools written for the rest of the world. And then, then it becomes it becomes just bottlenecks. And uh, I'd argue that the Internet Crime Complaint Center numbers are really, really low. I mean, it sounds it sounds like I'm being really, really low. Yeah. So I'll give you some numbers. Um, I agree they're low, and it's hard because you have to self-report, but. Herb and I did a white paper on this because we wanted to quantify this for our target customers, which are the middle market um, small businesses um, that Dante was talking about, or the ones that are sort of most vulnerable. So 47% uh, of US business organizations were hit with ransomware in the past 12 months. And 40% of business victims globally have paid the ransomware ransom, is what we found. Um, 2,315,931 global users have been affected by some type of ransomware between April 2015 and March 2016. So I can validate it. We have more or less the same numbers. Uh, we just don't believe they're reliable. Because uh, you think they're too low. We think they're way, way too low. Uh, it saw the Department of Justice put out 4,000 attacks per day. And Q1 2016, 210 million. In 210, uh, estimated $210 million in payments and recovery costs, because it's not just paying the ransom. You have to wipe and make sure systems are clean and get staff in place to do all that. So you have to uh, factor in recovery costs. And this $210 million, I would argue, is not even close to being the real number. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So 
someone else. So yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, my name is Danielle Dean. So I'm working on Danielle's again, um, <laughs> and I work for National Conference of State Legislators. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is actually for you, Dante. Uh, there was a hearing a little while ago, a month or so ago, talking about cyber insurance, and look, one of the main points that was made is the lack of actuar actuarial yes. data, um, and you know, I. I know that state governments have been looking at cyber insurance and a few uh, businesses as well. So, you know, is that changing and what can you know, state governments or other businesses do to build some of that information? Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> in fact, we, we do also work with um, the, the municipal space. We have a project um, in partnership with Governor Ridge's firm. Uh, Ridge Global, where we're bringing these types of solutions to municipalities and states. But you're absolutely right. The, the dearth of information that my technologist on the panel have described also affects us on the 